for, for coming in, for, for attending. Um, I'm, I'm Peter Jones, a, a professor who's starting as a distinguished professor of systemic design at Tech de Monterey in, in Mexico. I am currently living in Toronto, and so I'm between um, um, Norte Americano uh, from, from the United States, from Toronto, and Mexico, and now here. This is my first of four presentations, and as Evan had suggested, when he, when he perhaps said, I'm a handful, I can, I can go long. So these four presentations may actually be one very long one. So I, you may not hear all of them, but the one today and, and, and for this talk is, is spring. And, with, uh, it, and so the, the four are the four seasons. So I'm starting with spring, and at uh, Monterey on Monday, I'll be presenting summer. And then uh, autumn in Toronto um, later next week on Friday, and then a winter in Washington, D.C. Uh, so with spring, I think of possibilities. And in thinking about the audience here, this is my first time in Bogota and my first time at UNAL. Um, given that we are joining, RSD 12 today and these presentations with uh, the uh, Congresso design research. I wanted to speak about the farther reaches of design research and the possibilities of design research that are lent by, uh, that are given by systemic design and from my experience with it. So the, this is about transdisciplinary impacts for system change, which is where I think the real impact of design research, the ultimate effects of systemic design for changing systems in through the tools and practices of design. I'd like to also start with an inspiration. Um, this is the English translation of, of Jorge Luis Borges's uh, A Compass, on Compass. Uh, and I will read just a little of it, but because you can read along, but there's a, there's a point I want to make on this about both design and system. So in a compass, all things are words belonging to that language in which someone or something, night and day, writes down the infinite babble that is, per se, the history of the world. And in that hodgepodge, both Rome and Carthage, he and you and I, my life that I don't grasp, and now I will jump to this point. Behind the name is that which has no name. Today I have felt its shadow gravitate in this blue needle in its trembling sweep. Um, this is a clue for me where the complexity show the complexity that we are designing for that we're designing within a language systems, we're designing for people with very di with different backgrounds, even our, our own communities. And that complexity systems though are invisible. Uh, they are inviolable. That is, we do not know how complex systems work until we start to poke, navigate and interact with them. And then when we bring them forth and describe them in language, and that's what I think Borges is saying that when these, these uh, the compass brings to life that which it becomes real for us in language. So these are some of my entanglements. I, um, that was a, a, a brief presentation uh, given by Evan, but and the the. Uh, the regular participants of the relating systems thinking and design community know me well because I'm one of the co-founders of the RSD um, experience or symposium from uh, 2012. We started at the Oslo School of Architecture and Design, um, part of the team that that um, created the Systemic Design Research Network, and then that grew into the Systemic Design Association. Um, I don't take credit for the term systemic design. That is Harold Nelson, who was part of those early beginnings as well. Um, you heard Tony Fry talk about the different contexts in which, you know, social, political, complex 
huge challenges. I try to work with those and entangle myself in, in some of the in projects in, in healthcare, healthcare systems, in uh, uh, the Flourishing Enterprise Institute, which is a research group. I'll say a little bit about our work later, uh, which is um, ecological economics applied to organizations. So it's, uh, it actually has at its basis uh, some design science as well. So there's, um, there, there's a lot more to say, but I just wanted to show that these are entanglements to, uh, in a sense that all of those organizations and projects can be interconnected across the systems and disciplines that we work in. We can learn from them together. And I wanna to speak about the, what I call the systems turn in design research. Because I think this the systemic design community is um, highlighting um, and bringing a context that new forms of research can um, that are focused on complexity, complex systems, and designing effectively in those domains. So the RSD relating systems thinking to design is now in its twelfth year of the symposium since its start at AHO, uh, and it's been sustained as a kind of tribe. From a very small group in 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 2012, which is a graduate seminar essentially, um, with uh, discussions and workshops with graduate students, and uh, and and a small number of, of of kind of leading people, and it's grown from that. Now RSD and systemic design are not exclusive. That is, there are other conferences that uh, that that bring you know that. Um, uh, that enables systemic design research and recognize it, it, and perhaps in different terms as well. But it has started as a design praxis that is not from the system side, uh, which is its own praxis, but from a, uh, a mix of new design approaches that uh, were being raised um, from different schools and then new methods, teaching, and then research and theory. So there was by starting as a praxis, that is, there is a practice of designing for complexity and for large, large scale systems because we had to, because this was available, because they, that is the next stage. You know, this gets to, I'll make a reference here of, of Bruno Latour's 2008 paper of Akashis Prometheus, where he talks about design leading for matters of matters of concern and not matters of fact anymore. And so these are matters of concern, these types of systems. Uh, but I'd say that other sciences, physical sciences and disciplines actually start more from active experiments and then develop theories that follow and arts and design work that way as well. So we don't think of that with physical sciences and hard sciences because they have been developed past the point of their original experimentation for hundreds of years. You know, so we're not at, you know, we're not in the era of Mendeleev or Poincare or, or Maxwell. We are, you know, there is a lot of physical sciences theory and, and research, but systemic design is kind of at that stage of, of um, leading to theory. So we've been developing theory, I think, with uh, the RSD. Um, and so systems thinking, on the other hand, is a theory first discipline. It didn't start with uh, practices. Um, it started with uh, the, relate, uh, the understanding of, uh, of, of how um, what was understood in sciences could be linked by, by, by uh, systems that translated across the sciences. So the Part of the spring of possibilities here, the promise of systemic design is just that to integrate across disciplines in the same way that systems theory um, was construed, was established in its earliest years as a framework for integrating knowledge across disciplines. Um, and so if we look at the promise of systems theory from Kenneth Boulding's um, The Skeleton of Science paper in 1956. He believed that all the sciences studying different units of analysis, essentially different units, they all shared, they had uh, common systems of scale. Um, and disciplines, though, 
with each discipline maintains what we can call what we call a truth regime uh, as a hierarchy. That is, there are different regimes, uh, epistemologies, knowledge systems that are unique to each discipline. So, and we can look at a hierarchy from really math, but physics, chemistry, biology, psychology, and design kind of follows psychology, if you will. That is, we can, we, we the sciences of design are newer. They follow from learning and practice, and we've encoded them as types of theory. Well, I think systems theory gives a lot of basis for the, you know, I've spoken about this for a decade now, but it might be new. You know, some, I, I still think this is something we have to continue to look to consider and encode, that there is still good systems theory that applies to the different, across disciplines, that allows design to make sense and, 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 and provide value across, across those disciplines. One of the clues in this, it, it, they also, of course, continue to believe this in the systems field. So Jennifer Wilby, who's um, um, well-known in the IEEE, um, ISSS, the International Society of System Sciences, um, I, I like her quote that just in the way that we can think of a discipline as a body of knowledge, bodies of knowledge that focus on the investigation of a particular unit. Um, that is the object of, you know, of, of the study of, of biology is the unit of organisms and, and life itself. But these are described in very detailed ways within each discipline. How do you design to those? I'll get to that. I think design promises interconnection across, the, across these units that systems theory was unable to sustain. So I think this is the promise of systemic design is, and the, the possibility is to bring to life in the way, uh, the value of design across disciplines, because that's, we're always working in systemic design with leaders in other disciplines, as opposed to other designers. <laughs> that is the, uh, we are already working with these different units. This is a, a snapshot from uh, my colleague, David Ng's um, um, website, coevolving.org. And he, and he and I have done a lot of discussions on just this uh, skeleton of science idea from Boulding. We think it is still very viable after, six, after more than 60 years. And, and just a summary of it, you can see the kind of scaling or hierarchy of the different units. And he basically said there are, we can look at two approaches for this, the way that we uh, analyze phenomena systemically. And the one on the right, the second approach is a hierarchy of complexity of organization. So the structure of how systems are organized from um, frameworks, that is uh, structures, uh, simple dynamic systems like mechanical, clockworks, uh, control systems like thermostats, or the realm of cybernetics, um, going to open systems, self-maintaining, um, co uh, um, cells to then organisms such as the, um, the genetic societal level and up to animal, human, and symbolic and transcendental. These are, you can see though, the way that scientific disciplines became so specialized, especially after about 1956. Not long after that was the famous talk by um, the Oxford uh, lecture by um, uh, C.P. Snow on the, uh, you know, on the two worlds of humanities and sciences. And they were, and, and that, and, and, and Professor Snow was saying then in the late 50s that we were going to now entering a, a period where humanities and the arts were going in one direction and sciences in another, and they were not going to be, uh, they, were, they were going to diverge and we would not have the well-educated, fully educated, well, you know, what was considered a well-educated person in the university prior to the 50s was more of a generalist. And, you've, and the PhD program started growing um, 
about that time and became very specialized. Um, and so we've been in that world, this world that Snow uh, described in the, um, uh, I mean, we've grown up to it. We were born into this type of specialization. I think design and systemic design with the kind of ways of working across disciplines can bring back the skeleton, the way of working across um, sciences in different uh, communities. So uh, I'll, a, a simple image of this, and people who've heard my talks before have seen this in even like the, the 2014 publication of, of systemic design principles. It's in there. It is evolved from time to time, but it is a it is the um, what I call the design domains or four domains of how design practice and the theories of practice can be organized. Uh, I consider that uh, uh, you know transdisciplinary design is it involves more stakeholders. So you notice from design 1.0 and the bottom going up to four that there are more people on the right, and that is to suggest in the, in the original formulation of this by uh, G.K. Van Patter, who is a colleague of mine from the early 2000s. We were working on transformation design back then, and, and we didn't call it systemic design. But the aim actually of a lot of systemic design is transformation or system or social change. But um, we really, I'm considering that I represent that as complex social systems now. Transformation is a operation on those, so on those systems. But there are more stakeholders that are um, necessary for informing how we do design, the validity, the quality, the, 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 the knowledge to make the design decisions are, are, are invested in the stakeholders themselves in design 3.0, which is organ for organizations, social purpose, social innovation, for, would be within a, a boundary of an organization. And uh, design 4.0, which you can say is complex systems that are more unbounded, can be, we can think of these as um, networks in multi-stakeholder multi systems or um, uh, also system change programs that may work across different types of uh, um, communities. So we need to, we're informed in our design decisions by those stakeholders, by a greater variety as we go from design one and two. Now design 1.0 and 2.0, um, let's say as we look at the different modes of practice, I, I consider design 1.0 is essentially design of artifacts or communication systems that are, that are well-defined within a brief and that one or two designers and a sponsor can develop together. So it's a small number of, of contributions. The design decisions are with the designer because it's a, it's a process of what Van Patter calls strange making. Design two, that is to make things stand out and noticeable. Design 2.0 is product service system, product or service systems, or even product service systems are um, pragmat, you know, are um, well understood within a market or the users for, for the product or service. That is the design decisions are invested in the designer with a team, um, but it doesn't change the organization usually to develop these services. Um, so these are the challenges in, in these levels, one and two are pragmatic. They're implementation challenges. Uh, we aren't creating, we aren't changing the way that the systems affect people's lives and, every, and, and experiences. We may, there may be implications in how a particular you know, tool or device or system is created, and then we will, our lives will follow that. But that then becomes more of a system as it, as it unfolds. Uh, we don't always foresee how systems are created from artifacts or, or but I will say here that um, in design three and four entail, that is they include to, um, the skills and the necessity of, of design two and design one. So as you go up, we in all of these design skills are, I think, um, going to be necessary. That is the um, it entails the the all of those skills as capabilities that are also brought into designing for complex systems. But in in designing for complexity, 
um, we are in a situation where the variety of stakeholders and the participants must really be part of the research. So we're, so what have we learned? Oh, what have we, um, please uh, change the slide. What have we learned over time in systemic design um, processes or in, in practices, I mean? So uh, I, I think the field has actually matured um, to an extent that is 12 years of these conferences, but um, it has expanded uh, in a way. I'll just quickly speak to you know, how other fields, how design has shown up um, over the years preceding um, uh, RSD, for example, long before. So um, uh, Ryan Murphy talked about design science, but even proceed in design science comes from an information systems field, preceding even a lot of that, but informing some of that is the ideas, of, the idea of design in the systems field itself uh, came out of the notion of designing for social systems, because social systems can be designed with the people themselves. The parts of a social system are the people, the stakeholders, and they are the parts of a whole system and they have agency and can and can themselves um, influence the design but the whole the whole social system also has agency the organization has a purpose and a movement these ideas showed up in the systems field um, a little over 50 years ago with people like Hassan Oz Ozbekan, John Warfield, Russell Acoff, uh, Bela Banathy, um, uh, my PhD supervisor um, uh, Aleko, Alekos Christakis and uh, Eric Yanch. But, oh, oh, did I drop away? Oh, uh, the translation drop? Mm -hmm. Okay, perdón, un momento, is it reparado? Uh, should I say? Um, let me continue for a little bit, you get just to, uh, so leading design authors, yeah. Mm -hmm. See. No. So design authors then that that referred to systems in a, a kind of the early systemic design. Um, if you would say, would be people like Hugh Dubberley um, and, uh, and Klaus Krippendorf, um, Don Norman, uh, Christopher Alexander, uh, with his work on pattern languages and, and synthesis of form, John Chris Jones, uh, and then Harold Nelson, who I mentioned, is I, I would look at his work, The Design Way, his book with Eric Stolterman. He developed it, uh, Harold had approached people, you know, some of the people that started our those that started RSD way back in 2011 to publish a collection of 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 papers on what uh, on design in in systems context and there was not enough work then just a little over 10 years ago there was not enough work then to even publish a collection so we formed the RSD community as a, as a collection of a small number of people that would start to develop some of our work more formally so that it could be published. So as you see today, we have 12 physical locations uh, you know, around, uh, around the world plus online uh, at different schools and, and places for, you know, for this distributed um, conference. So what else have we learned? Uh, so I'll say a little more about units of analysis here, but systemic design can be thought of very simply as a uh, design practice that draws on systems theory to use that theory to effectively design for complex systems. But it's, it is uh, why it's necessary now, uh, or today, systemic design is growing now, so it is starting to expand, really expand, even though the value of it is still not recognized well by other fields, and I think even in design. So keep that in mind that we need, um, this is a promotion or 
publicity, but the understanding of, of what we're trying to do, that we're working at a different scale, a different approach to design. As a design practice, there, I think, is unlimited potential for this, because in design three for organizations, in design four for the for the uh, fields of complexity that uh, you know in in in, in systems and system domains, um, as this unit of design for the system, and because RSD uh, uh, valorizes that is takes seriously. Uh, systems principles, the practice does have academic rigor. It has the ability to to publish well, and I think to to develop serious research. But research in systems takes longer. That is to show an effect in a large, in a complex system, in a healthcare system, and working with municipalities. It takes longer. It may take patience. Uh, there's also incredible potential to succeed with other design programs. By that, I mean projects that may have had a name like transformation design in the mid 2000s. It and that ended by 2010 and, and partly by its own success. That is, it became a quick fad. It took one year and then that fad just broke it. It, it didn't, it was no longer because it didn't develop where it could reach its potential and, 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 and uh, make good on the promise of transformation. It takes some time. So I've talked about systems, but not my understanding yet with you as to how, how I think they are defined or should be defined. So let's just like have a, a level set. What is a system? I don't want to get into that uh, a, a philosophical discussion here because we could be here for a long time, but it is essentially what are we observing when we would say that we're observing the behaviors in a system, that we can say that this is a system as opposed to human behavior that we're attributing to systemic effect. So the answer to this depends on our epistemology, you know, on the, that is um, how, we, how we believe um, truth claims are formulated. And so if you're a constructivist, that is a, uh, and this is a, a this is a probably the predominant epistemology in cybernetics is that sy that systems are whole contexts that is they're describing a whole composed of parts that interact in complex ways but they do not exist as things in the world you can name them but you can't point to them and when you do you're pointing to something that is partial so that th th they exist as language defined by our agreement that is the system is how we agree to its definition and then its description and our interactions with it are largely defined in language uh, now for critical realists and there are critical realists in the systems community and there are some in design although i don't i'm not sure this is this is more really a research point of view i think for a lot of us is that systems do have ontological validity. That is, we can study them. They have real functions that correspond to the units of observation. That is when I talk about an, or an organization um, that, that can be considered by critical realism. That is that that organization exists in the world. All the different observations we can make are parts of it, but we're dealing with a real system. Uh, and much of it may still be intangible, but that is no less not real than, um, you know, the, you know, the activity, you know, the, the nervous activity within the human body that, that is, uh, that uh, transits uh, uh, you know, the nervous system that we cannot see. So much of, much of our own uh, internal, much, many systems are intangible, right? But just, but the critical realism may be also defined like this, that the system is seen as a collection of entities or elements interconnected and that interact with each other can be tangible or intangible. And a pragmatist perspective, and I think this is where designers really work, is that, the, and for design research can be seen as often as, as I think we're, we're more pragmatists, 
suggests that systems are an organization of functions in a named whole, like an organization where that has a particular name, such as you know a a um, uh, Apple computer that is uh, that has a purpose and human participation. And so that's it, it may almost seem obvious, but those are very those have different adherence with different theories and different methodologies. So I'll say um, that constructing system challenges then uh, are um, then the way we define what a systemic challenge is. That is, what's a good challenge for us in design? Um, uh, for uh, as uh, we often define these challenges as system change. And systemic design develops methodologies and new theories that allow us to be more effective in, in, in um, uh, and I won't say solving, but addressing, intervening, re, uh, many, uh, many different mindsets than problem solving, because systemic design is, does not tend to be a problem solving mindset. So the our approach to challenges such as these, so these are the, some of the units could say that are found across the design domains, complex organizations and, and, their, and their processes that are, are the parts of that system, multi-stakeholder initiatives, like um, I've worked with um, a number of groups on attempts to define new economies and how uh, new, new economies can be developed concurrently with the existing neoliberal economic system, like in Canada, UK, and the US, uh, groups like uh, the Wellbeing Economic Alliance. And I've worked with, you can consider these groups as multi-stakeholder initiatives. And so we're working with, you know, complex change in economies, for example, multi-organizational networks. So I worked with seafood, seafood sustainability, which has, uh, which has a, a network that contained or that that joined about a hundred nonprofits or non-governmental organizations, and maybe uh, thirty to forty fisheries, and and ten to ten to twenty customers and large organizations such as Walmart, um, and so that's multiple organizations with a common with attempts to define common purpose, service ecosystems, socio-technical systems such as healthcare processes policy design and the and system implementation from policy it's a very it's a different perspective uh, in taking a systemic design point of view and transformation or systems change and so systems change is a a new unit i guess it's a well it's a it's an operation on these on the unit of the system to find more effective ways to affect social change within complex systems and so a number of uh, foundations that fund nonprofit organizations for change projects, ranging from half a million dollars to five or ten million. These these foundations are now try have a common, or they're now trying to move towards actually funding the system change as opposed to projects. It's a big mindset change, and so these can be these are are different challenges that are can be also well understood by people in business and healthcare and policy and technology. That is, we can use a common language. I'm going to go quickly through some of these uh, these slides here, but these are, um, I'm going to talk about design research methods, but not in depth. And make these slides will be published and, and a lot of this, there are some very new things here too, but I will just start by showing in, in the systemic design toolkit, which can be downloaded from systemicdesigntoolkit.org um, and, and the book that Crystal Van Ale and I co-authored, co published a year ago, um, we published a 30 design methods that can be used in, in stakeholder-based design research for complex system problems such as these. Also, we'll just, um, oh, the next. The, um, the um, next slide. Uh, also, when so those are these tools in that big um, ring, that ring of the thirty tools showing how they're connected. Those are all um, th those are templates that can be used as posters or in 
online whiteboards for for stakeholder participation that help define different system system research questions, if you will. And but they aren't themselves the modes of research. There is a st the stage two listening to the system, which does include um, specific research tools that would be used in design research for that whole seven stage process that's in the book and in the toolkit. But when we look at the range of methods and the way that we would mix design uh, research methods for any complex uh, project, we can look at, um, uh, you know, I'll, uh, I'll just show the, the framework for this that we can uh, use them methods for both understanding and prediction or anticipation for change and design or design, as I should say, that is the, in, these are design uh, or these are research intents by which different methods can be joined together to accomplish more uh, impact for, uh, and that are more tailored for a particular problem. I also like to consider the mix of different modes of research methods. So in the color um, uh, uh, words, um, labels, we have generative, interpretive, evaluative, analytical, and participatory. So the description of that is in other places. The, but on the right, these are stages of workshop engagement. So that's another situation, which is how you engage um, uh, which I'll um, say about from here. So we don't, when we're, there are, uh, we include different stakeholders, actors, participants from, from a system um, or that are representatives of the system that we're observing or studying in different ways and in different stages. And that's what that diagram was showing. Let's say then, uh, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll say again that we don't study systems directly, but the units of analysis that those systems are, uh, that are within them, that that system is associated with. So here's just a, a set of this. This is fairly simple. It may not look, look like that at first, but it, it is just to show that the different types of systems that I'd mentioned before uh, that were, and some others, that ranging from very higher to lower. So an ecosystem, you could even consider a bioregion, a territory, um, maybe a very large scale system. And the units of analysis may be, that is if we're naming it as an ecosystem, we may study a city as, as, it's, as a type of ecosystem, as an ecology, because e ecologies are a type of system where all of the parts um, are, are living agents that have some agency, but the whole doesn't have agency or doesn't have a purpose. It emerges. It, um, and and we, can, we can work with economic regions. We can work with landscapes and bioregions. These are the units. With an industry, we can, uh, an industry is kind of a vague thing. We can have industry groups, but what are those? We, we could consider that the units may be a sector um, an industry network, a political, a political system, maybe anything from a city council to the city itself, to an assembly, a state, also global as a, as a political uh, system, uh, an enterprise or an organization as, as a system, but has different units. A social system could be a community of practice. It could also be a whole organization. It can be an enterprise, but they are all... Uh, um, but when we just say social system, we have to define what we're meeting, what we're studying. Also processes can be um, systems, but we study the systematic processes within an organization or within a process such as healthcare or socio-technical systems. So each unit then in this diagram called a, a socio-ecological socio model. So it's um, based on Bronfenbrenner from like 1979, but we've created tools from this that show how, how people navigate across different levels from micro to macro to eco and, um, and also time, chrono, across these different levels, if you will. And I'm gonna, and, and this unfortunately builds, so I'll just start, I'll do this quickly. These um, within from the, from the center out, 
we can look at, at smaller processes, such as soci STS socio-technical system, processes, organization, sector, ecosystem as, as the larger one. But then there are different methods. We wouldn't use just whatever you're trained in and whatever we prefer as, as research methods as the source for methodology. In socio-technical systems, we may need to approach um, complex uh, you know, medical, like an operating room and new uh, intervention, um, techni in intervention techniques uh, being used in operations, uh, um, you know, in, uh, in surgery, that we would want to use a, a realist process, contextual realism, and maybe activity theory. Um, uh, design uh, ethno, go ahead and click all these through. Uh, design ethno methodology we might use for, for uh, processes. So, Oh, I overclicked back one. Yeah, and uh, so these are these, these are um, method in black the uh, approaches we may that define different methodologies that I think would be appropriate for those. For an ecosystem, we have to have a, a dialogue across the different ontologies, not just the stakeholders, but we have to have a way to have dialogue with the natural system as well maybe through representations of the landscape, the, the plants and animals, the water, indigenous perspectives, multiple perspectives and multiple ontologies. And so some of the actual methods that I've clustered are there on the right. So that, that, that may be fairly detailed, but I wanna give you an idea. The main idea is that in these different levels of system, we would really start to look at how to most effectively understand and, and whether we as designers would be leading the action. In most cases, we are working with the stakeholders for, to understand the best decisions that they, that they would be making as co-designers in these processes. So now to really simplify it, I'd say it's also not wrong to say the stakeholders themselves are the system. So stakeholder selection, that is, I just said that in all these complex systems, we're contexts, we will, um, we will develop um, processes that either um, in, inquire, interrogate, interview, or holders in workshops where various degrees of their agency are used, are brought into the design process. Make that and the, the more complex the system, the more they would have to say, because the designers themselves may not be capable of, of making those decisions. But stakeholder selection, therefore, who we choose to, to include in these engagements may be the most critical risk and blind spot in these, in these contexts. So the choice of participants can itself be more consequential than the methodology. Um, and so this is, gets to, the idea of a variety of what's called requisite variety um, and the variety within people. So people have multiple perspectives and, and bring uh, a number of different, sometimes uh, multiple ontologies even that they can speak to and the variety between people and participants and other uh, system actors can lead to the, the choice of good representation or let's just say efficient representation may not lead to the best outcomes, decisions that may be effective or reliable in our design. So methodology, of course, is very important, but using, but engaging stakeholders with a democratic structured process so that their, their participation can be, you know, uh, substantively included. And so I'll just, this is, in the design journeys book, but it's one heuristic for selecting stakeholders that may have what Nassim Taleb calls skin in the game. So this is from uh, Christakis and Ken Bausch's um, uh, 2006 book, uh, which I've worked with, you know, since then, um, is, you know, stakeholders should be informed, uh, impacted directly by the outcomes or decisions, design decisions interested, sincerely interested, invested, personally invested, um, and, and implementers, and, this, and that takes time. And then this is in some other talks, so I won't say much about this, but just to get an idea then how you sample in higher complex context is 
You want to sample across multiple perspectives. You don't just do segmentation by the market. Um, I actually try to use for uh, 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 Bruno Latour's um, modes of existence from uh, his 2013 an uh, a book about the different ontologies of modernism. And even though there is kind of a critique of modernism, that is also a way it's valid to consider. Do we have um, people that represent consumers, entrepreneurs, perform, uh, uh, arts, business, governance, social change movements? These are different ways of being. And you don't just have all only social change people. You may need legal policy and arts people as well. And they may not get along, but that's part of our design. Then we would also design for these steep criteria, which are well known, in, for example, in foresight. So for example, do they have an interest, a focus in the social technolo technological economic? And you can select from those as well as diversity criteria, such as the range of ages of cultural identity, gender, ethnicity, origin, political commitments. That's a lot of variety to take into account, but we, and there's no perfect way to do that, but there are better ways to do that. And so then our common ground in systemic design research, I think comes from participation, from participatory mindset that was really foreseen, I think very well by Liz Sanders, who, who gave um, a keynote talk at RSD5 in 2016, and, and, who's, uh, who, and I teach from her convivial toolbox book, um, Sanders and Stoppers. But in 2008, this diagram of, the, of showing the future direction of design research in this area, she, in this new direction then she called the generative design research led to the participatory mindset um, um, and partic beyond participatory design, but a whole participatory mindset. Um, and so the, after, uh, so we see that as being a common ground. That is going to be the case across all of these methodologies. And, uh, and then I mentioned in design journeys, there are four essential methods that are, are in this stage two listening. So stakeholder discovery is one of the biggest ones. Mapping actors, um, doing, uh, developing good research questions, engaging the system participants, actor net uh, network relationships. And so to, to finish, I'll just say that what's important about a lot of this is how we work with other disciplines, how we become transdisciplinary designers and, and can make impact with those other disciplines as the designers that can learn those, those other disciplines and work well with them. And so systemic design research may involve other disciplines um, and in transformation context that is in system change we're always in constant co-creation with people that are invested in those change programs. But systemic design is not yet well understood, even in design studies, I'd say. And so, but, our, but in other disciplines that recognize the need for this type of, of engagement and participation in their research and their action, action research would be policy studies, a lot of, sci a lot of science, um, new sci science, if we're looking at what changes intervention should be made based on earth science, and climate and ocean science. Those are design questions and business disciplines. So I think these other disciplines and they learn what we can do can lead the adoption and integration of system design practices. And also they, these disciplines own the system questions. We don't. I mean, you may as a PhD re researcher, as a professor, but they're, these are, um, they don't really, their discipline may have those questions at stake. And so the majority of my research and a lot that I advise involves a real integration of organization, innovation, economics, and ecology. And also well, I should say in emerging projects in Latin America I'm seeing are showing a real increase in socio-ecological design within many of the countries. Um, let me skip through uh, this um, and just say that, the point of this side, this point is that systemic design then has unique potential for what I think is the real expansion and extreme expansion of interdisciplines because of, of bringing a creative design and research capability to um, these areas. 
Um, so it's, and we, and some of the problems we're facing are struggling with grants and the scope and funding of grants, and we may think too small. And so we, we can take on more complex questions. Uh, it's a matter of framing and how well we do framing. So I'm seeing that it's almost at the hour. I think I'd like to just um, close um, uh, with uh, close soon here, but to um, so I'll skip over a couple of things for the people that are following me. Um, but I'll say just if you look at the RSD website, RSD Symposium, you'll see 540 plus papers in the the main paper corpus across uh, these different themes, and they're. They add up to more than that because they're multi-counted, some of them, but across everything from architecture, culture, society, economics, and organization, um, health and well-being, socio-ecological design. And if we look at clickstream, uh, this um, diagram from PLA Plus One from 2009, this is this is how, shows how uh, scientific disciplines actually. That people doing research across disciplines actually interact. There's a lot more interdisciplinarity than we think. I'm going to skip over a couple of my own examples because uh, that would be in municipalities and in healthcare. Um, um, we can ask, I can bring them up and answers to questions, but um, I think I would need to finish. Um, this is an example of a systemic design artifact known as a synthesis map done for um, cancer, uh, you know, for. Canadian Partnership Against Cancer. So it's a cancer policy design in a, vis in a visualization to be used by policymakers. And then I'd finally like to close on possible directions for um, Latin American uh, systemic design studies, where I think I'm seeing directions and a lot of possibility for urban flourishing, systemic sustainability, you could say, be the, like what Tony Fry was saying about sustaining what's... Um, sustaining sustainment. Uh, we call that flourishing. Bioregional regeneration and working with landscape stewardship. I know of very good work being done in the Barichara region uh, of bioregional regeneration by Joe Brewer and his, and his work here in Colombia. He's visited Toronto and we hosted him at OCAD for a talk to on, on developing um, bioregional regeneration in, in the uh, Toronto Great Lakes region. I'd say healthcare system evolution is an area we, you know, that would be necessary almost everywhere. Um, innovation policy, policy design labs can be developed like we have in Canada. We have many now, and some of my students were among those to lead those um, from, from, from OCAD's, uh, OCAD University's program. And system leadership in businesses and nonprofits. This is a, an emerging area of, of um, executive leadership and management that, that works with system mindset and principles. And I'd say um, contra innovation um, to um, improve food systems and, and contra fashion, like slow fashion. And these are areas that I think would be very viable and possible. So, um, so I'd like to open it up for questions, especially from the, the live audience here. I don't know how much time we have here left. I think um, online, if there's less time there, we might take an online question if we have more time here. We actually have sessions starting uh, right now on the hour, Peter. Um, we have the uh, CTC opening at, for colloquies uh, for transgenerational collaboration and also uh, the panel there in Bogota on design is meant to start. So just, just letting you know that we're, we're on the hour. Okay. We have a good audience here and I'd like to hear any questions that you have here. Are, are there any questions in the, the chat though, Cheryl, that I can take first? Um, just let me check. I've, oops, sorry. Just let me check. I've been bouncing back and forth between rooms. If anyone has a question before you um, leave this space, maybe just jump in. Um, Actually, uh, if you guys can hear me, can I just ask, yeah. is, the, is, the, is the papers session in that same space? In no. Oh, is it? Oh, oh it is? Oh, oh okay. Uh, it's not assembled yet. <laughs> okay, so... Um, what we could do then, I guess we'll just let this run and you guys can can work that out. Okay. Sorry.
So yeah, uh, Peter, first of all, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts and your knowledge. Um, I'm Jesus Ortiz. I'm a systemic designer from Politecnico di Torino. So you may know mm. the people over there, Silvia Barbero and all that folks. Misty seven. Yep. Uh, so it seems that in the in the path to to become a systemic designer, it always be there about uh, the the industrial sector, you know. So as a systemic mm. designer, we always or the majority mm. of the time we we work with industries yes and from that point of view no so i would like to ask you what about like uh the fact that the systemic design can reproduce that 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 systemic that oppression oppression mm -hmm. systems mm -hmm. you know between mm -hmm. between industry the industry sector and uh, those oppressors that are affect of that no you know and then it's an important question yeah what what about your thoughts about it and how we can uh, as systemic designers avoid that or those uh mm. those paths and become more aware of mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of of that that kind of uh, scenarios it's so, Jesus. Jesus. Yes, uh, i would say that we shouldn't avoid it and can't avoid it that as even tony fry had mentioned um that he even worked with defense in questions of war, I've worked with the US military and I'm also a peace activist. I work with industries and I'm also, you know, work with environment, uh, ec ecological groups. I think from, I think one of the things we can do as systemic designers is to bring that perspective in a tr the transdisciplinary. So understanding that there are other disciplines with points of view, but helping inform them about the impacts of different design the consequences of different design decisions that might be made as a result of different scenarios or directions that could be taken. Uh, very often, especially in industry, um, and this is where Tony Fry may be talking, also talks about defuturing, that once some decisions are made, it forecloses other possibilities. And as designers, we're able to intervene and ask those questions and to come bring to go back to the point of other decisions into into um to revisit um other scenarios and uh because we are often visitors in those industries and we're valued for the different skills and and type of creative thinking that we're bringing and i think even by framing systemic design as a creative approach as well helps give us the latitude for um, for those types of interventions. The, of course, there will be the reproduction of existing systems unless you, you know, if you're working with industry. I think the, um, the choices we can make are to choose other projects that may be easier as we get kind of older and more ensconced, that is, have more support because we have other, other types of, like in my practice, I have a lot more um, projects that are available to me after having worked in Elsevier, having worked for a lot of bad guys in the past, like uh, healthcare applications for Elsevier and things. They were actually, I think, good guys at the time, but, but that could be hegemonic in their own industries. The ability to change that hegemony or to intervene in it is also possible in some of the um, if we can form more powerful design groups that can be part of those um, part of those engagements. So it depends on how we introduce ourselves. It isn't, so I may, may have made it look like, you know, one designer, a systemic designer is doing this transdisciplinary work with different stakeholders. Sometimes that is the case, but we also with our methodologies need to choose other people that are expert in those other methodologies and bring our own team into that that way and to be wise about um that the that what might be um um neoliberal or economic um economically oppressive or continuing hegemonic systems are have a lot of history and we come in at a point where there may be the opportunity for some change 
and some change may often, you have to weigh that. It may be better than no change. It may create impacts in the future, even after you're gone. And I consider that with my work with the Air, with the U.S. Air Force, for example. Thank you. So much. Okay. Okay. Uh, hi, good morning. Um, and I, I like to study the system design. I am a master's student. Mm -hmm. And um, I, in the, in the process to review, um, I review the literature to systemic design. Um, I have uh, an, a little question. It's uh, what is the importance uh, to the uh, co-creation uh, or the collaborative design in the process to systemic design, for example, in a policy design? It's essential. Uh, when I was talking about the participatory mindset and Liz Sanders' approach to generative design, it's exactly what we would call co-creation. That The diagram I kind of skipped over that showed the four boxes in a cycle are what I call contexts of co-creation. I, I show those in the Design Journeys book and, and other, there's an article on context of co-creation that, that I published a few, three years ago or so. And, and there are, it isn't just that we use co-creation in workshop engagements, we would use different methods in each of those workshops as experiments. We would build on the knowledge from each of those workshops in ways that further participation and open up our understanding, help share knowledge. But there's also different types of engagements in the small group, which I would call the lab, which is like in our own, which would be the designer and your sponsor and your, that is not the client then the studio is bringing in the client as well and their people. And then the arena, which is the, the people of the system. The, that is, we think about the arena in a political context, it's, it would be those that are affected by the decisions, a dialogue with in the arena. Um, and so these are call for different types of, of, of co-creation. So I think there's a whole, you know, there, there's a lot of, of, of methods that we can used to improve co-creation. We see some of those in RSD as well. So a, a, oh. a question, um, what is the path forward in industry uh, when there's a lack of trust in systems and changing systems yeah. and organizations are structured around units and functions rather than holistically? So what is the path forward in that world? Well, if, I, if yet the intent of the question is how do we enhance our effectiveness or ad by, advocate for this yeah. discipline in organizations yeah. that are resistant yeah in terms of the way forward uh, one is well is is publishing beyond even the, the scientific literature i think the you know we have a good foundation in the, in the literature now and continuing to build on that is good we have um f free and very available material what we haven't done i think is to communicate the value from our projects well, even within the groups that we're doing this stakeholder-based work in. So like the work that I've done for the, you know, with the US Air Force was involving um, dialogues with larger groups of people on the ethics of, or it, we were starting to touch on the ethics of autonomous um, uh, weapons and sensor systems that would be used in 20 years. The, our, how, how research will develop that. We were hoping to raise bigger questions with that. I still think those questions could be raised from you know, that work. Um, it can be difficult to get the grants or the support, the, the funding to, to go back to work that we have done that we could take forward once we really understood you know, its future impact. I'd say in systemic design, it has a very strong futuring aspect that is we are often working with things like you know that ideas and context that may be 10 or 20 years ahead of the current time that we're invested in we may not realize that you know the question the those you know that, that the systems we're actually working with are going to take that long to evolve uh, it, it can be difficult to know when, when and how change is going to happen we have better tools for that, I think, but we have to use those tools, such as the theory of change tools and influence and outcome mapping 
um, we can use those types of tools with stakeholders for them to start to take you know, charge of, of their own future direction from this. We can't, so there is, um, I think, inspiring our, our um, clients and stakeholders to, you know, to, um, to continue working with uh, our, our, our contexts and tools, I think would be um, uh, one uh, real way to do it. That is keeping them going because we cannot always stay in these research driven or grant or, or project, you know, project based work. We may be with a community for six months or a year. It may take them five years to achieve the things that we've developed. You know, so and if we don't always stay there for five years, let alone ten. So that is part of what we have to address. I think is that we're we are working on futures in a large to a large degree. We have to make that story more compelling. I'm probably not the best storyteller. I tend to be comprehensive and analytical, and you know. <clears throat> It's like, you know, expansive, but we need good design storytellers. Does, uh, do, do you have a follow-up or is that good? Okay. Is there any other last, last, last quick question? Okay. Great. That's fine. We don't have time. Okay. For more questions. Okay. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, Peter, thank you very much. Oh, <laughs> good to see Gracias. you. Um, Evan, are you still on the call? And I, I am here, yes. Practicing in the world. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to take uh, two minutes to properly say goodbye and to thank you uh, for those here on the audience and for those on the audience uh, online. Uh, my name is Juan de la Rosa. I'm, I'm the Dean of the School of Arts here in Universidad Nacional. Um, and for those who didn't catch uh, the whole, what's the whole thing, what's happening, it's um, through this process of uh, setting up the Congress, uh, Congreso Internacional de Investigación en Diseño, uh, we set up uh, an amazing alliance with the uh, RSD, with Related Systemic Thinking Design Symposium, uh, and their intention to this year do an international hub. We are part of 16 hubs right now. Peter, correct me, 16, right? Uh, 13. 12. Oh, 13, 13. 13 hubs, sorry, 13 hubs around the world, uh, including uh, Bogota, Mexico, uh, Canada, Oslo, uh, Torino, uh, and I'm, I'm leaving a whole bunch outside. Uh, and as part of our alliance, it is, or it, it has been our pleasure to be the first hope here to start the celebration of RSD, of Related Systemic Thinking uh, Design Symposium uh, as part of the, uh, uh, of the Congress. Uh, Evan and, and Cheryl, thank you very much. It's been uh, uh, terrific. It's it's a lot of work, and I, I want to thank especially those magicians and geniuses uh, over there who are like making possible that we transmit uh, this conference not only for us here in Colombia, but for the whole world to see it and for RSD to, to be part of it. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much to Peter. Uh, I believe that there's a huge importance on this topic for us for designers of thinking systems i believe that as peter mentioned at the beginning of a conference uh systemic design it's it's a way of seeing things that relates to complexity and i think that um now as ever in the history of the world it's becoming more complex like the world the relationships the the way we produce the way we consume the way we uh uh make this world, create this world is becoming more complex. We're dealing with issues that we have probably never dealt in the same way in history. So I believe that integrating systemic thinking is not just, uh, shouldn't be just an idea. It should be like uh, the, the horizon of what we see as designers. So thank you very much to RSD. We will continue to be connected with the, with the uh, rest of the conference and we will continue following you uh, through the next couple of weeks uh, and uh, we will
continue today with our papers. So thank you very much over there. Uh, thank, thank you, you so, so much. Um, we will, uh, so we'll end this session and uh, we can move to the, the next session, which is still in the same room for you, but a different Zoom room for us. So thank you, everybody. We'll see you soon. Okay, thank you very much, Evan. Bye-bye. Thank you. And for technical people over there, please join us in the Diseño Sistemico room. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Y yo quiero hacer una anotación adicional, y es que en estos momentos nos vamos a quedar en este auditorio con las ponencias de